Missouri garage grade. Let's go four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. Bobber is an unfiltered lager brewed with inspiration from pale German lagers. And the noble hops provide a little bitterness. And my favorite part, Bobber has a crisp, clean finish. And this cup of inspiration was brought to us by these fine people. First up, we have... We have Princess Jenny from the FB and the LI. I'm not sure what the FB is, but LI has got to be Long Island. So there you go. Next up, a big, big thank you to Candace and Joel in Little Rock, Arkansas. Candace and Joel say, rock your jib. Well, they're kind of getting aggressive with the jib. Next, we have Shannon up in beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota. Like your jib. We got Peter in Hickston, Wisconsin. Remember, we said according to the USA Today, Wisconsin has several of the drunkest cities in the U.S. of A. So, of course, they get my love and respect. So a tip of the cap to you, my friend, Peter and Hickston. Well, we're coming after you, Wisconsin. Parts unknown. Raise your glasses. Unite. Speaking of parts unknown, we have Dolores. Yeah, well, maybe Dolores, you can start drinking a little more. Pull your weight around here. Next, we have Jill, who's got the cupcake blues in Omaha. And last but not least, we have Julie, who says, cheers from Columbus. Wait for it, Captain. Wait for it. It's Columbus, Georgia, our sister city. Get out of here with that nonsense. O-H. I-O. We want to thank everybody who purchased our bonus show, The Brick of Family Murders. If you Mm -hmm. haven't checked that out, you can do that by going to the iTunes store or our store page at truecrimegarage.com. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, Snapchat, Instagram, Untapped, all that stuff, you can find us with the handle at True Crime Garage. That's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Uh, they told me that I was being arrested for a homicide. And what went through your mind at that point? I mean, I knew I had never hurt anyone, so I wasn't really too worried about it. I believe you testified on direct. You thought Chuck was an odd man. Yes. You think that's funny? I think he's an odd man, yes. You think that's funny? It's not funny. Okay. I just thought you were smiling. I thought you thought it was funny. No, it's not a funny laugh. Well, I mean, this is America. If you want to laugh, you can. No, it's not a laugh. I never thought I'd be arrested for a crime I didn't commit. Would you? Would you believe you'd be arrested for a crime you didn't commit? I didn't commit one. Neither did I. All right, part two of the Ryan Ferguson case. Yeah, well, there you go, Captain. You get to hear a few snippets and little pieces of the trial itself. Mm-hmm. I tell you, I tell you what, I found parts of this trial to be incredibly fascinating. Right there in that clip, you are hearing the prosecutor. This is Kevin Crane with some back and forth while Ryan Ferguson is on the stand. Mm-hmm. And that's that's Kevin's kind of loud, booming voice that he has that's perfect for a courtroom setting, kind of really trying to get under the skin of Ryan Ferguson, kind of picking on him a bit there. And I'll tell you what, the, the best way I could describe uh, Kevin Crane, the prosecutor. He's arrogant. Yeah, but you know, the thing about him that, that I found strange was that he he almost appears to be like an actor portraying a prosecutor in a movie or a TV show. Like the, the way he speaks, the, when he chooses to raise mm-hmm. his voice and, and, and the way he kind of gestures at things and struts around the courtroom. You're right. He's, he's well, very yeah. arrogant, arrogant, but I get the, I get the, it's like I'm looking at an actor playing a role, not a real life person. Yeah, he's a douchebag playing an asshole. So what ends up happening here is that we have the police and the prosecution. They end up offering Chuck Erickson a plea deal in exchange for his testimony against Ferguson at Ryan's trial. Mm -hmm. The trial doesn't take place until 2005. Now, along with Chuck Erickson's testimony, we also have Jerry Trump. Remember, he's the janitor working at the Tribune that night. Mm -hmm. Now, he states and he testifies at trial, that he saw Chuck Erickson and Ryan Ferguson at the scene. He says that those are the two men that he said jumped up from behind Kent's vehicle when he called out into the parking lot that night. Now, how does how does Jerry Trump arrive at this situation? Because he wasn't able to identify them early on in the investigation, right? Right, and like you stated, you know, detectives said 
this guy's not a credible eyewitness. Yes. And so the thing here is what, what Jerry Trump says is that while he was in jail on unrelated charges, his wife had sent him a news article about the crime. And he claims that, that on that newspaper, he saw photos of Chuck Erickson as well as Ryan Ferguson and immediately recognized them as being the two men that he had saw standing by the vehicle that evening. Now, so on the witness stand, we have this other weird situation where we have Chuck Erickson who was unable to give a detailed description of the crime or the murder during the the confession, quote unquote confession portion of the questioning and interrogating. Uh, However, once he gets on the stand, we see a very different Chuck Erickson. We see a guy that is, he's able to give an extremely detailed description of Mm, the events of that night as well well studied. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and as well as a a extreme, extremely detailed description of Ryan Ferguson strangling Kent Heitholt. Chucky might've been a, you know, a drug user, but he, you know, he has a high level intelligence. So he also liked to just, he would just seem like he would like to argue like these intellectual battles with the lawyers. Mm Mm-hmm. One thing I found strange, though, when they show um, Chuck Erickson walking, being escorted in to the courtroom, Mm -hmm. did you see that part where it looks like he almost turns and kind of stares down Ryan Ferguson? Like he like he tries to stare him down like he he goes out of his way to move his head all the way to his left to kind of just. And later on, there would be claims that like there'd be claims by Chucky saying, hey, uh, a lot of the reason to get him to talk about or you know not to confess but to testify against ryan was because all these people were saying all these rumors around him were saying ryan was going to throw him under the bus Mm -hmm. so you know i'm going to throw you under the bus first so maybe that's why he was staring him down like hey i gotcha right now the defense they countered that uh you know all of the evidence found at the crime scene that night it pointed elsewhere it did not point to ryan ferguson uh, none of the hair, none of the blood, or the fingerprints well, see, samples okay. collected at this crime scene that night, they they did not match Ryan Ferguson or Chuck Erickson, mm-hmm. as a fact. And Well, no, there's seven fingerprints, right, mm-hmm. on the car? Mm-hmm. Seven fingerprints on, on Kent's car. And um, none of them matched. They didn't ma- match Erickson. They didn't match Ferguson. Right. And there were no traces of, of the victim's blood uh, found in the vehicle in Ryan Ferguson's vehicle that he was driving that night of the murder. Yeah, so it basically comes down to that there's zero evidence against Ryan, mm-hmm. and there's two witnesses that weren't credible to begin with that are now somewhat credible, I guess, and they testify. And Ryan actually gets on the stand, which is pretty unheard of in a murder trial, and he's convicted. And mm-hmm. he's sentenced to what? 30 years for, I believe 40, 40 years, years total. Uh, he gets convicted of second degree murder and robbery. Now the thing here is though, having Again, no evidence of robbery, right? And having watched portions of the trial, I will admit here, captain, that seeing Chuck Erickson on the stand, if that is, if, if, if and I imagine his testimony took a long time because they mm-hmm. have him acting things out. They're going over question over and over again. The thing here is, is seeing him on the stand, it, he, you you look like you're you're watching a man that seems 100% certain in everything that he is telling you. And not only that, he's 100% certain that he himself is guilty. Right. And this is why he's come forward and he's telling on this Ryan Ferguson character. So I can see how the jury was swayed in that way, even despite the lack of evidence. But you would think there would be some physical evidence. Well, I think the thing that's hard for us to understand is when you watch a trial, we go, how could they find him guilty? Well, remember, this jury didn't know him. They didn't see the little Dateline montage of him growing up and how great of a kid he was and how amazing his calf muscles were, right? They don't see that. So all they're seeing is a guy that they don't know, and maybe he doesn't. I don't think to me, as far as like Ryan Ferguson on the stand, he comes off as somebody that is malicious enough to do um, what Chucky is saying. But Chucky, he, Chucky seems a little odd. And when he's making these 
actions and and showing how well this is how we punched him and this is and then this is how Ryan, Ryan strangled him. He looks a little crazy. Yeah. So you know, as 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 far as the jury is concerned, why wouldn't they believe that this guy is possible? You know, this guy possibly had something to do with the murders because he's a little nutcase, right? Mm-hmm. Well, ultimately, we get like we said, Ryan gets forty years in prison. Um, we have Chuck Erickson who gets. 20, I believe 25 years was part of his plea agreement with the prosecutor. The problem here is, Captain, there are some real problems with this story. And I'm talking about the story that the police and the prosecutor put together and Made supplied up. to the jury to, to ultimately get this conviction. Mm-hmm. So let's go through some problems with the story, okay? Okay. So first off, now... This is a this is according to freeryanferguson.com. Uh so I could it might I, be a little biased. I could see if some people would think it's a little biased, but this statement would be verified later and we'll get into that later, okay? Um so, but but the first thing that we have here is the 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 bar itself. Remember by George's that's uh the right. captain's favorite bar? Um by a, George's by George my favorite bar. According to employees of the bar, as well as a city ordinance and state statute, um, that bar closed at 1.30 a.m. On that, on that Wednesday becoming Thursday morning. Right. Okay, so... So that goes with Ryan's story. That goes exactly with Ryan's story. He says, we were at the bar till 1.30 and Ryan then I Ferguson drove... Ryan Ferguson was exactly right. I drove Chuck home and then I went to my house. Now, keep in mind, that goes completely against... Chucky's story. Now you got mm-hmm. me saying Chucky. It goes against Chuck's story That's because the Chucky. It goes against it in two manners, right? First off, they weren't at the bar as late as Chuck had originally stated, mm-hmm. and second of all, they would not be able to come back to the bar at two forty-five a.m. and then stay for an additional hour to an hour and a half, dancing and drinking and having a good time because, mm-hmm. according to the state law. That bar was not open at that time. At least proving that one of the statements in his story is a lie. Mm-hmm. The next thing that we have to point out is Ryan's phone records. We touched upon this in the first episode. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, so going through this, Ryan Ferguson, he was he, he was absolutely on his phone. His phone was being used between 1.41 a.m. and 2.09 a.m. This Now, this does not entirely discredit uh, Chuck statements, right? Because Chuck does state that after they left the bar, Ryan was on his phone. Right. But it does confirm, it reconfirms Ryan's statements. You're exactly right. It, it goes more toward the way of Ryan's statements have, having been true that he went home, he was on his phone, then he went to bed. Okay. So now we have Dallas Mallory. Remember mm-hmm. we talked about Dallas Mallory. He was the playa, playa. slightly older guy. You know, a little bit older than the guys, uh, Ryan and Chuck. And he was the one that they saw at the intersection that night shortly after the murder. So with Dallas two, Mallory is the only person who can corroborate any part of Chuck's story. Mm-hmm. Now, in December of 2004, okay, that, that was what they got from an affidavit in December of 2004. He later then stated that he was not at... He was not at that intersection that night. He had not si- seen either Ryan or Chuck that night. Furthermore, we have proof that Dallas Mallory did not have a valid driver's license at the time or a vehicle. He didn't own a vehicle. He, he had had an OMVI or DUI, whatever they call it in Missouri, right. and he had lost his license due to that. And I believe he sold his car either because he couldn't use it or to pay for some of his legal fees. Right. So he doesn't have access to a vehicle. He doesn't have a driver's license at that time. Now, furthermore, well, the (laughs) furthermore and furthermore, the thing that happens here is, well, remember Chuck was able to state that Dallas was wearing a police officer's uniform that night for a Halloween party. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is police say, well, there's your proof that, that Dallas Mallory saw those guys at that intersection. The problem with that is later the Ferguson family is able to prove that Dallas Mallory and Chuck Erickson were at one of the same Halloween parties earlier that night that Chuck could be confused and he actually saw him 
at a Halloween party. I believe there's a photo of the two of them. Uh, we have Dallas Mallory standing behind Chuck Erickson, and Mallory is in full police uniform outfit. Right. So yeah, he black. You know, Chucky blacks out, does a bunch of blow and 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 a bunch of other drugs, and he, he blacks out. But he does remember seeing this guy at some point, Dallas, and he saw him at some point in a police outfit. So that goes with his story, but also proves that it could have happened at a different time. The other thing that's interesting is the fact that, you know, he claims that Dallas stopped at a red light. Well, those lights aren't red or green at that time of day. They're flashing red or flashing yellow. No, so they're, they're flashing yellow. So they're not well, a cycling no, light. Right. But what I'm saying is at, if it, at an intersection, you'll have one section that's flashing yellow and the other intersection normally flashes red. Mm-hmm. So one will have to proceed with caution. The other one might have to stop depending on the traffic. The The way that Dallas was going, quote unquote, is he would have been faced with a yellow light. So he never would have had to stop. Yeah, I believe. So again, they, these are multiple sources saying that this story is bullshit. We also have Shauna Orn, and we talked about her uh, working at the Tribune that night. Now, she is called to testify, but she never specifically is asked, did you see Chuck Erickson and Ryan Ferguson there that night in the parking lot? And she, and what, well, and what she told the cops and what she told prosecution is that those were not the, the two guys that she saw that night. Yeah. And she would later state that's why Kevin Crane did not specifically ask me that question because he knew I was going to say no. Those weren't the two guys that I saw. Right, but doesn't the defense get to like, you know, have interviews with these witnesses and talk to them, and and so they would know that if I ask her on the stand, can you point to the person that you saw that night uh, in yeah. the courtroom that she would say, and I can't because they're not here. Right, and that would have been huge for the defense. It would have been a big step in the right direction for the defense. And, and they talked a lot about how like he would uh, slow draw. Everything took forever. Well, to and it say. it did, and you know what? I think a big part of that was, though, Captain, lack was, of preparation. Uh, what it was, I think. It, I think it's partly that, but I also think it's a bit of a surprise. I think that you had Erickson on the stand, and you had Trump on the stand that were saying much different things, much more detailed things, pointing every arrow at your client. And I think it took him by surprise. I think yeah, it took the attorney by surprise. you get a lot of this information. You know what I mean? You're, you're handed a lot of this information. Uh, you're also, th- we also see a situation where they were not handed some information that could have helped their defense as well. So I don't know that I want to go out there and say you're handed this information. Whoa. No, but what I'm saying is that you have a list of these people and, and you can have a somewhat of an idea of what they're going to say. And you're listening to... You get to cross-examine afterwards. So, you know what I mean? So you do have time to prepare as it's happening. It's not like you're the first one asking questions is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we also have the the possibility of a potential other suspect. Now, remember we talked about, we went through the detailed accounts of that night before we talked about a man named Michael Boyd. Um, mm-hmm. Well, he's not really investigated. He's interviewed but not what I would consider investigated. Well, he should have been investigated because he was the last person to talk with with Kent. So Yeah, as far as we know, the, he he's admitting that he was either the last or second to last person to talk to Kent Heitholt that evening. Mm-hmm. And if you go by his timeline compared to when the 911 call is placed, that almost puts him standing next to or right by Kent at the time of his murder are very close to it. Well, yeah. And I, look, there's, there's a ton of evidence and ton of speculation. That's like, the, they got the wrong man. But the fact of the matter is he's convicted and he's in jail and he's sentenced to 40 years. Now, Ryan Ferguson will eventually get to appeal this conviction and they will have another trial. Some new things come to light at this trial, right? But unfortunately, we have a situation where the verdict, the guilty verdict, is not overturned with this first appeal. Yeah, even though they brought up, you know, tons of evidence, mm-hmm. tons of evidence that shows that the the detectives and the defense didn't interview, I think, 11 witnesses. 
that so, should have been called in the first trial. Right. Yeah, and then in 2009, we have uh, a new character comes into the fold, right? We have high-profile Chicago attorney Kathleen Zellner. Uh, she decides to take on Ryan's case uh, pro bono. Mm-hmm. And in 2012, well, her hard work and her investigator's hard work, it pays off because at this point, both Chuck Erickson and Jerry Trump, basically the two that single that together mm-hmm. took down Ryan Ferguson and got that guilty verdict, even though there was no physical evidence, they got them to recant their trial testimony in statements given to both Zellner and her investigator. Now, yeah, and just to show you how powerful this is, that if you do recant, especially because you were in a trial, mm-hmm. you can be facing perjury charges, and so you could actually do time in prison for this. Right. So as far as like a as far as like the outsider's eyes, to me, this recanting your statement actually holds a bunch of weight to me because mm-hmm. you're possibly facing you know jail time. Well, Zellner, she files and she gets a uh, habeas corpus hearing. So during this hearing, this is when both Chuck Erickson and Jerry Trump admitted that they lied in Ryan Ferguson's trial. Now, Chuck Erickson claimed that the prosecutor, this is Kevin Crane, that he had pressured him into implicating Ryan. Uh, Chuck testified in the habeas hearing that he does not remember the evening of the murder because of his heavy drug and alcohol use that night and that he did, in fact, black out. Now, we also have the situation where you see Chuck. Chuck, he comes forward and he originally says that Ryan had nothing to do with this, that he, that Chuck was the one that that single-handedly carried out this murder. Right. But in this hearing, he states that he has no memory of that evening, just like he told the police in his original statement. Now we have Jerry Trump, okay, who recants as well. His story about his wife sending him the newspaper and him seeing the pictures of the two boys in there. uh, He actually says that, that it was, he saw, it wasn't his wife that sent him those news, the newspaper that he actually didn't see that newspaper until he was at Crane's office and Crane had showed him the photos from the newspaper. And basically, right, which is basically stating that the prosecutor is helping me create the story to be an eyewitness, and that's illegal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and like we said, Crane was in some of his own legal troubles at the time. Uh, probably thought that you know, I I don't want to pick a fight with the prosecutor with this very aggressive prosecutor, um, mm-hmm. and you know, stating that Crane told him something like it would be helpful. Uh, to the state, it would be helpful for Jerry Trump if he could identify the two guys at the crime scene. Well, and then Michael Boyd's going to come back into the story as well. This is the co-worker that claims that he talked to Kent right, you know, seconds before he's murdered, and uh, his story has changed like five times. Yeah, Zellner, uh, Ferguson's attorney, will point out, you know, to to the to the trial that that we have these conflicting stories that have changed time and time again, as well as she's going to point out that timeline that we talked about earlier, that because of some of Boyd's own words, that places him with Kent Heitholt at the time, these are her words, at the time of his murder. Well, weren't they also able to present evidence that that proved that there was evidence withheld from the defense? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, this would have been some of those eyewitnesses that you stated that, that were called in this hearing. Um, one of them being Ken, Kim Bennett. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was a person that was at the bar that night at by George's that night. Um, the prosecution did not tell the defense about speaking with Kim, Kim Bennett. Now, Kim, ben- why did they not tell them? Because Kim Bennett told the prosecutor that she was at the bar that night and she left sometime between 1.15 and 1.30 a.m. And during that time that she left, she saw Ryan Ferguson and Chuck Erickson get into Ryan's vehicle and drive off at that, at that same time. Right, which would go with Ryan Ferguson's story. Yeah, the other person that they didn't that they failed to tell the defense about was a guy by the name of Mike Shook. Well, who is he? Well, he's very important to this case, in my opinion, because he is an employee at the By George's uh, bar, mm-hmm. and uh, he testifies at this hearing 
that the bar, in fact, did close at 1.30 a.m. And that he did not let anybody back into the bar after the bar had closed. This, again, would disprove Chuck Erickson's story. Well, yeah, let's call it what it is, you know, Chucky and the police's story. Mm -hmm. So now, Captain, we also have Shauna Ornt. Um, and we talked about her quite a bit, so I won't go through the whole thing. But during this hearing, we do get to, get to hear her state why she thinks um, that she not only why she thinks that she wasn't asked to directly identify Ryan Ferguson, because we know that answer. But mm-hmm. furthermore, she states that, that her interaction with the prosecutor, Kevin Crane, she found him to be what she called threatening. Uh, that he constantly was asking her to implicate Ryan Ferguson as being one of the people that she had seen in the parking lot the night of the murder, and she time and time again would not, and he became very aggressive and almost threatening to her. Right, and like she stated from the beginning, telling the police officers, telling the prosecution, that's not the guys I saw that night, not the guys I saw. Mm -hmm. And then you got this prosecutor, you know, the one that's a douchebag playing an asshole, being aggressive and and basically threatening. Hey, you need to say that this was Ryan and she wouldn't do it. It's weird to me that he would even put her on the stand. But um Well but who knows. Luckily for, for Ryan that the uh this conviction is eventually vacated. Uh this would be in two thousand and late two thousand and thirteen. Uh, He was soon after released from prison and exonerated of all charges. Yeah. And this, this was a lengthy, you know, we kind of skipped over it, but if we went through every single trial and every single appeal, there was a bunch of failed attempts. And probably a lot of that had to do with the fact that the prosecutor became a judge Mm -hmm. and this is one of his big cases. And that would go against the whole system then the whole system's bad, that the, the cops are bad, the prosecutor's bad, and now the prosecutor's a judge, so therefore the system uh, is, is failed. Yeah, so, and I'll tell you what, and I, I know that the conviction is overturned, but we're not going to finish there, because what I want to do next, Captain, after this beer break, let's go mm-hmm. through this, because what happens here is we have beer. a conviction overturned, now this presents a whole bunch of other questions. You know, what really did happen that night? So let's let's answer those questions after this quick beer break. We all need to take better care of ourselves and taking care of our mental health is no exception. That's why today's sponsor, Talkspace, the online therapy company, makes it easy to connect with the experienced licensed therapist handpicked just for you for as little as $32 a week. I love them. I use them. Check out Talkspace. Using Talkspace, you can send your therapist text, audio, and video messages whenever you want, and even do a live video chat. If you want to vent about work or your family or talk through something that's been on your mind, that's no problem at all because your therapist is there and ready to help. And Talkspace's licensed therapist can put you on a path to a happier life. To sign up or to learn more, go to Talkspace.com slash garage. As a special offer to our listeners, you can use our coupon code GARAGE to get $30 off your first month and show your support to this podcast. That's code GARAGE at Talkspace.com slash garage. Again, Talkspace.com slash garage. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. All right, we're back. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, mates. Cheers. So here's how we're going to do the second half of this thing. Now, yesterday when I was hanging out in the garage with the captain, I told him, you know, I'm going to bring with me tomorrow some questions that I kind of just want the two of us to talk through together. want to hear his opinion, give my opinion, and kind of walk us through this case a bit and maybe come up with some answers here. Because with, with Ryan Ferguson being let go, exonerated, now, to me, there's all kinds of questions in this case. Uh, now, but to be fair, I should point out that the captain has not been told in advance about these questions. So we're going we're, to start you off with question number one, Captain. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think that Ryan Ferguson actually committed this crime or was involved in this crime, but somehow got lucky and ends up getting off? My, I don't believe so. I think he is a kid of good character. Not a kid anymore, obviously, and there's no physical evidence 
And so, I mean, he was convicted on basically two lies. Mm-hmm. That that's my thoughts on it. Well, I I agree with you. Uh, the the only time I kind of questioned uh, his guilt um, was like like what I said with um, Erickson's demeanor on the stand. I questioned it a little bit, but having seen the actual confession tapes and the interrogation tapes, that kind of discredits that one hundred percent. But also seeing the composite drawing that was provided by Shauna. Um, it, to me, it actually looked somewhat like a mashing. If you took, if you took Chuck's face and you took Ryan's face and kind of smushed them together, that it would look somewhat like, like the both of them. However, she that, outwardly yeah. states that these are not the guys that I saw that night and there's no question in her mind. So to me, I got to go with what she said. Well, when they right, but when they also say, I, I think the first thing for me that I went, Oh, that's a little odd is when they claim that. One of the people they saw had an athletic build. Mm -hmm. And a lot of 17-year-olds are not going to have this noticeably athletic build. And Ryan did. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the first thing that made me go, "Ah." and I see your point that Chucky was very convincing on the stand. And that's probably why he was found guilty was based off of Chucky. Mm -hmm. But... Let's just go with the whole fact that, you know, he was coached up by Crane. He was coached up by the prosecution. He was coached coached up from the beginning. When he went to come in and confess, he was coached up at the the word go of the confession. Yeah. So yeah, of course he he's an expert on what he has had conversations about, but these weren't things that actually happened. Uh question number two. Okay. Uh, you know, Ryan Ferguson, in our opinion, didn't do it. Um, he's been exonerated, I think rightfully so. Um, but do you think that Charles or Chuck Erickson did have some involvement or like he did say at one time committed the crime completely by himself? If we go by Ryan Ferguson's timeline, which we believe to be true, that they left the bar at one thirty AM, he was able to return, return Chuck to his home and continue on to his own home and get there by one forty. Then it's conceivable that Chuck could have returned to the parking lot of the daily tribune in time to commit the murder. Yeah. But again, with his confession and yeah, it's two years later and, and Chucky has a drug problem, but, or had a drug problem. Um, he might still have one in jail. Who knows? But again, lack of lack of evidence, physical evidence there, you know, there's never any talk about DNA, but you would you would think that you'd have at least some kind of DNA on the belt. And, and again, they're not bringing it up. So let's just assume it's not there. Seven fingerprints on the car. Not one of them match Chucky. Not one of them match Ryan. So is it, is it possible that he got dropped off by Ryan and he was in this, uh, coked out state in this, uh, alcoholic state and he just went out looking for more. It's possible. But again, where's the evidence? Yeah, and he doesn't even, you know, I said that somewhat the facial thing could look like the composite drawing, but he doesn't physically, you know, his height and his weight and his build do not match what is described by Shauna there. The person that she describes is several inches taller than him, uh, several pounds heavier than him, maybe 20, 30 pounds heavier than him. Um, And And his motive doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Plus his, his, what he claims he was wearing that night does not match the description of the clothing that Shauna gives at all, um, that evening as well. Uh, the thing here too, regarding Chuck, like I pointed out in the, I don't recall if it was earlier this episode or if it was late yesterday's episode, but the, the whole process about the interrogation, want to not drink so much, the whole process of the interrogation where the, the detective wrongfully says that that Kent was hit 15 times with this object and he gets, he gets Chuck to agree to 15 being the number. Right. Uh, it's obvious to me, not only does Chuck not know how many times Kent was hit with this object, neither does the detective. So I think that, uh, that clears up, up Chuck for me again, weird with the, with no skull fracture. Mm -hmm. That's, that's an odd thing to me. And when, when they're at trial, and Chuck is describing how he hit uh, Kent. 
and how how forcefully and how fast he says that he hit him and in that overhand motion right um I, I I struggle to believe that if they were using a tire iron or some kind of tire changing tool that they got from Ryan's trunk that or that he brought on his own that hitting with that velocity that he, that he would not be able to that there would be no skull fracture seems right. very strange to me yeah um this is kind of an out of the box question for you captain right. but um do you think that there is something wrong with Chuck or Charles yes. And I don't know, it, it, chicken or the egg. I don't know if it was something was wrong with him mentally. So he was then self medicating through drugs and alcohol. And then that led him to the point where he's at now. Because he definitely seems a lot clearer these days. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so which one was it, chicken or the egg? Or what, you know, did he start using drugs and that created some mental problems for him? I think he's not all there. Yeah, I get the vibe that there's some kind of personality or social, some kind of disorder there. Maybe it's undiagnosed. Um, we do know that the prison system does not do a great job of checking on people's mental health right. in situations like that. Um, well, and, the, and, the, and just being confined to that space is going to do a number on your mental health anyways. And I understand that I'm observing his life on small sample sizes you know, over the course of a period of time, over the course of 10 years or so, right? But what I saw is I'm seeing almost a different person every time. Right. Did you get that vibe? Like, Yeah, okay. but let's, let's be honest. I mean, crime would happen when he was 17. Mm-hmm. He would confess when he was 19. So that's when we first start seeing him. It's 1921 is first trial of Ryan Ferguson. So that would be the first time we'd see him. And then you're seeing him later, you know, the other trials, you know, three years after that, five years after right. that. So, I mean, you're going from a 19 year old, you know, to 20 some year old. That that's a whole different world. No, and I, I I agree, and that's why I pointed it out that I'm talking about him over the course of a period of time right. because I agree that physically and mentally and emotionally he's changing and adapting uh, throughout the course of time. However, to me. I felt like I was seeing whoever he decided to be or whoever he was told to be in that moment. Yeah. And meaning when he is interrogated or when he's, especially when he's being driven around and questioned about the locations of things and where they went, he to there, me, he looks like the confused person that he believed he was. Right. He looked like a blank canvas that knew nothing that had nothing on it and was going to wait for people to apply their own impressions. When I see him at the trial that you got to admit, that's a 180 degree change right there. It's not just a guy that the goes first trial. Yeah. yeah. Not just a guy that goes from knowing nothing to knowing everything. There's like a certain amount of hate in his eyes. And it almost looks to me like there's, there's hate in his eyes for Ryan Ferguson. You know, like I said, it appeared mm-hmm. to me like he kind of tried to stare him down as he walked into the into the courtroom. And as he was sitting there on the stands, you see somebody that's very aggressive. He can't wait for the prosecutor to get the words out of the prosecutor's mouth to, to start answering his questions. Well, again, but if that speculation is true and what he was saying is they have inmates talking to him and I wouldn't put it past the cops going, hey, let's tell some of these inmates that Ryan's going to turn on him. And we're going to get Chucky all nervous, mm-hmm. right? So, may, yeah, maybe it was like, you know, uh, yeah, I know I, we kind of, I kind of got us into this mess and I don't really know what happened that day, but uh, you want to throw me under the bus? Look, Chucky is not an idiot. He, he actually seems like he's actually a pretty bright guy. He likes to challenge. He likes to debate. Probably would have made a pretty good lawyer. But at the end, but at the end of the day, he's a little nutso. So that little nutso turned into... Uh, I got to get this guy before he gets me. But while he's on stand, he you're he seems like a man of conviction. You know what I mean? Of a man that said, you know, I've done something wrong, and this is the only way I can make it right. And I'm I'm going to I'm going to go down fighting if I have to, but I'm going to make this right. Yeah, Chucky's so weird to me because one, you have this ridiculous story that doesn't make any sense, and you don't even have a, you don't even have any of the details. And then you come forward, they hand you the details. Now this guy's in jail, you're in jail. A couple years later, you feel so bad because you don't know if Ryan was there. So you put the whole blame on yourself. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of helps out Ryan. But at the end of the day, 
neither one of you probably were there, and Brian Ferguson's story is probably true. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I feel for the guy because, like I said, there is something off there. Definitely has some intelligence, but something is definitely wrong there. I agree, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad that you saw it too because I was thinking maybe – Maybe I'm kind of weird and just seeing something that's not there. But well, I you're saw, weird. But I saw yeah. it again when when he changed his story to that that Chuck was the only one guilty, and then later when he changes his story back to I don't remember anything of that night. I swear when I look at him and he says that the final time, I see in his eyes and I almost see his face of that of that 19 year old boy again of that of that blank canvas that just truly didn't know what was going on and is waiting to be told what actually happened that night. Um, we should point out though, right. That, that Charles Erickson remains imprisoned. Yeah. Which is, it's a crime, man. It's a crime as, as much. Look, Ryan Ferguson is definitely the all American boy. You know, he, he's, he's a good looking guy. He's physically fit. Apparently his calves are incredible. Incredible, incredible calves. I think he does like some fitness stuff now, like Spartan races and stuff like that. Um, smart kid. Uh, seemed to always do the right thing, was involved in, in athletics and stuff like that. And yes, Eric got them into this mess, mm-hmm. but he's like the forgotten one. Oh, great, we got Ryan out. Okay, that's great. But we still have somebody convicted of this murder, and we all know, and the system knows, that Chucky didn't do this, right? So that's a crime in itself. And then you got to put on top of that, there's a victim in all this. Right, right. There's a guy that we we don't know what the motive of his murder was, mm-hmm. and it was a vicious murder. I mean, this guy was held down, probably had a foot on his chest, and somebody's choking the life out of him with his own belt. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 Kent deserves better than that. And yes, I'm glad that the justice system, uh, you know, made a wrong a right. And yeah, I'm sorry that Ryan had to spend time in jail. That's injustice. I believe so. But it's injustice that Chucky's behind bars. It's an injustice that we're not investigating the case to solve the murder of Kent. Yeah. And we should point out too that Ryan has said that he, you know, he wants to help Chuck or or who's going by Charles now. He wants to help Charles with his release from prison as well, even though, like you said, you know, Ryan ends up in prison because of Charles. Yeah. Um, and you know, he said that he will continue. Ryan will continue to fight, uh, for the innocent people that are in prison, including Charles Erickson. One of the things that you can tell that makes Ryan such a good dude is one Trump, which lies, right? Um, lies on Trump, Jerry Trump lies on the, yeah, let's not make this (laughs) political. Let's not start Uh, a fight. Oh man. You don't want that fight. (laughs) Yeah. You don't want to, you want to fight. You don't want to fight the man with small hands. Um, Oh, what I'm saying though is is he forgives Jerry Trump. Jerry Trump has had his uh, trials. He's you know not a good guy. And anybody that anybody that is uh, anybody that has crimes against children, I can't have their back. But what Ryan says is he can forgive Jerry for lying. Right. He also forgives Chucky. So I think that's a sign of of a pretty. Um, self tune person. Now, I don't think he forgives Crane at all, but that's just that's my opinion. But so I, I think it's good, Ryan. Anybody, if you if you're invested in this case at all, do as much as you can to help Chucky out because he's just going to be there. Well, and Crane is sort of the puppet master, right? And it's hard to it's really tough to forgive the puppet master. You can forgive the puppets. But you don't forgive the puppet master. Yeah, but in Crane's defense, you are handed a case based off of the detectives. Mm-hmm. There is no case. Um, now, he should have, from the word go, say, I'm looking at these tapes and this doesn't line up. And No, thank you. I'm not I'm not running with this case. The cops should have stopped this from, from you know, two years. They had nothing. That's fine. But... But you didn't get anything afterwards. You got a bunch of false stuff. And when they should just be lined up, taped against the wall, and, and I, just let me punch their face for a while because they kept on saying stuff like, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm just interested in the truth. No, you're not. You stupid piece of shit. You're not interested in the truth. What I was saying is it's it should have stopped at the detectives. It should have stopped there. And and when they when none of the pieces of the puzzle were fitting, you stop. 
and they deserve punched in the face. All right, let's let's shift gears here for a second, okay? So, uh, Captain, with without naming names or pointing fingers or or, or doing a who done it type thing, uh, do you think that this was a premeditated murder, or do you think this is you know unplanned? Uh, I don't know if it. I don't know either way. I don't look because. Obviously, it was a vicious attack, and I don't think that need to, you know, a vicious attack needs to be planned or not. Mm-hmm. And also, I think the evidence of maybe it's not planned is who would, who would get in an argument or a tussle with a guy and, and plan on, uh, you know, choking him to death with the guy's own belt. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean, that'd be kind of a weird plan to come up. with. <laughs> you bring up a very good point there. Um, you know, and to further that point, it's. You know, you're attacking a large man with an object that we've pointed out time and time again was not strong enough to create a skull fracture or with not enough force to create some kind of fracture that that seems like you said, a bad plan. It doesn't seem to be a well thought out plan to bring that kind of weapon there. And then um, obviously you can't plan on using somebody's belt to strangle them. Uh, you, you know, especially a man of his size, how are you going to get that belt off of him? Well, it's very odd to me that the police came up with the motive of robbery when there's not really much sign well, of robbery. The way that the way that I understand it is they only came up with the motive of robbery after the fact, after having spoken to Charles Erickson about the crime and why he would have done the crime. Right, but uh, instead of trying to make the pieces of the puzzle fit, they're creating their own pieces. Yeah, and so when they're in the first investigation part of the uh, of the investigation, early in the investigation, they don't really have a motive to work off of uh, other than looking for those two, quote-unquote, college-age Caucasian males. Right, so what would be some motives? I mean, you know, maybe he's having an affair with somebody. Um, maybe, you know, maybe it's it, maybe it is just random. But like I said, there's no sign of of robbery. And so you're just going to. So the motive is just I was walking down the street and saw this guy and decided I want to choke him to death with his own belt. Uh, Maybe he had a gambling problem. To me, the choking the guy to death with his own belt seems very violent, very vicious, almost like you're trying like that was a statement piece. And so did he. I mean, he was a sports writer. Was he into gambling? I'm, I'm I'm not for sure. Well, okay. So you you brought up motive. The problem with motive for me kind of cycles back into is this premeditated or unplanned. Um, here's what I think. Here's what I see anyway. Um, I I see somebody like you said this this strangling the way that it went down is very vicious. So that to me either points to somebody that had a very deep hatred for this man and wanted to kill him. That would imply that it's premeditated or that this was some kind of rage, that there was some kind of argument or some kind of incident that took place. And it was, you know, split second rage that took this person over and they they raged so hard. They didn't cause a fracture though. Right. And so You know, you ask, I've asked myself, how would this person come in possession of a belt that was on the man that they attack? I've heard Bill Ferguson, he pointed out something uh, that was interesting. He said that his daughter came up with a theory. And remember, we pointed out the size of Kent Heitholt. He was a a large man. He was not only tall, but he was big. Mm Mm-hmm. Early. And the thing is, she, his daughter said to him, you know, well, maybe, you know, sometimes with larger people, they will, especially men, um, they will undo their belt uh, in certain situations when they're getting ready to sit down. We know that Kent was leaving, potentially leaving for the evening. He could right. be driving home. Maybe he found it uncomfortable to drive with his belt on. And that was something that he typically did. And that would make the belt easy for the person that committed the crime to to take it off. Um, so that's that's an interesting thought there. My th- my thought too though would be: Is there a chance that Kent was looking for a weapon and undid his belt in an attempt to use it as some kind of weapon? We know that whoever he was, you know, arguing with, whoever he's having an incident with, or whoever decided to attack him, 
already has a weapon. Mm -hmm. Maybe he feels if I can get a weapon, I can better defend myself and removes his own belt or attempts to remove his own. Yeah. Or like you said, I mean, he's, he's just unbuckling his belt to get in his car, gets attacked and then just Mm -hmm. pulls it out. Um, but I don't, I don't know. The other thing too is like you said, we're not going to name any names, but we might as well. Well, we're going to have to. Well, Michael Boyd, right? We have to name Michael Boyd. But yes. the, but look, the, here's something that people should take a clue on. I think when Ryan was losing all his appeals, they needed to find the person, right? Yeah. They didn't have enough. They didn't have enough. They couldn't check enough boxes to get him acquitted on his own that they needed to check the box of, oh, by the way, here's the guy that did it. And I think they went after him and the and the media went after him. And yeah, he changed some of his stories. I don't know if he's innocent. I don't know if he's guilty. But here's what I do know. Is anything that once Ryan was released, anything when they're talking about this case, they don't mention Michael Boyd. And I think they right. do so for probably le- legal reasons. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't have a bunch of evidence then you can't be naming this guy as this prime suspect if he's not. Well, and as we said, Michael Boyd was interviewed, but not quote unquote investigated. And, you know, people that don't know much about this case are going to go, well, why was he not investigated? He was one of the last people to speak with the victim. Mm -hmm. Well, my only guess is this, is that, you know, they were told to be looking for two Caucasian guys. Michael Boyd is African-American. Um, therefore, and there's only one of him. Yes. And there's only one of him. So he doesn't become their immediate suspect. Um, that's probably why he was not investigated early on. Now I do want to throw this out there too at you, captain, and I'm not going to comment on the competence, uh, of the police department or the detectives involved in this case, because I, I don't have a full understanding of their investigation into the murder of Kent Eitholt. I only have a, a, an understanding of the portions that involve Ryan Ferguson and Charles Erickson. Right. Okay. So during that, we have two years before we get to those guys. Now, one thing here is we have a parking lot. We have several employees inside the building. You know, when you, when you first look at this case, if you don't know anything about it, you kind of assume that maybe there's this one dude working all by himself and he walks out into a dark parking lot in the middle of the night and help, happens to get randomly attacked. It's not so much that. We have a building that's got several people in it in a parking lot that has portions that are well lit and we have two very obvious security cameras on the building. Right. So what that would make one think is, Well, those security cameras were not working. This guy's killed in a parking lot where anybody inside the building could potentially see the attack, first off. Anybody manning those cameras or watching those videos could potentially see or have evidence, video footage of who committed the murder. Mm -hmm. Who would know that those cameras were not working? Well, you would then assume it would be somebody working in that building. Yeah, because they know that the cameras weren't working. Yeah, and I hope... And I don't know that they did or did not. And that's why I won't comment on the competence uh, on their competence regarding this investigation, but you have fingerprints, you have that hair. If those, those should be, and I hope that they were tested against employees that worked in that building. Well, and and also the belt, there's going to be DNA. There should, you would expect to see some DNA. There's at least touch DNA. Mm -hmm. So, So I, I'm hoping that they they tested that against the empl- the employees that were working that night and have somehow cleared them. It'd be nice to know that if the, if they've done that, um, we've not heard. But they're that. not going to. You're not going to hear anything about this because there's a guy that sits in jail that's accused of the murder. So this case is closed, my friend. They're not going to look into it. And I'm afraid you might be right on that. And also, look, it's you know Kent was a chubby white dude. You know, sports reporter. That's the inju- There's so many injustices here. You know, like I said, uh, again, we can't uh, we can't speculate on the investigation, but they had nothing. So then you get a little bite, and they ran with it, but they ran too hard, too fast, and they didn't do their due diligence, and they didn't view this as we need justice, we need truth, like they said, you need truth. And then they hand it off to a prosecutor trying to make a name for himself. And all the name you made, my friend, was shit stain. That's what you are. You're judge shit stain now. 
And then you have two innocent kids that, you know, have basically been locked up since they're 19. And then on top of that, again, if Michael Boyd had nothing to do with it, you have media running his name through the mud and making him look like he's a piece of shit. And we have really no evidence of that, you know, because did they test his fingerprints? Did those match? Was their DNA? Nobody knows. So that's an injustice. And then at the end of the day, we got Kent. That, you know, somebody's locked up for his crime, so nobody gives a shit. Mm-hmm. And and that, I think, when I first saw a documentary on this or a Dateline or something on this, I was really frustrated. But it was only a single, you know, a singular frustration that this innocent kid that could have been me or you or anybody that we grew up with charged with this vicious crime and then sitting in jail for almost 10 years when they're innocent, 10 years of their life being lost and how that affects their family. But now I don't know how, how many years later after seeing that documentary, it's like my frustration has grown with the whole, that whole system and there needs to be bigger checks and balances. Like I said, there needs to be, if, if a detective is going to interrogate, if the detective is going to make up falsities or give out details that they shouldn't give out that, you know, makes the, you know, makes the confession null and void. There needs to be better checks and balances. Yeah. And I think that the, you know, the defense team should have been able to do a better job of presenting the way that that interrogation went down to the jury than what they did. Yeah. But again, that's null and void. If you don't even get to the trial, right. they, you should have never got to the trial. I, I no, I agree. 100%. Um, as far as Michael Boyd's name goes, um, has it been drugged through the mud? Yes. Uh, it's not It's not uh, Kevin Crane's fault that his name has been drugged through the mud, in my opinion. It's the, the It's been the attorneys for Ryan Ferguson that has brought his name up time and time again. It's the online community that's kept his name running. Uh, we've mentioned his name here, too. So we're just as guilty as anybody else. So on that topic, do you think, Michael Boyd, uh, for you, it would be considered... Prime suspect number one. Uh, I mean, look, he's the he's in the same location, roughly about the time of the murder. So I think his story is very important. The problem is he's changed it multiple times. Yeah. So um, I don't think him necessarily changing it means that he's instantly guilty. But why are you changing the story, bud? You know, mm-hmm. like just tell the truth, stick with the truth. Again, though, a lot of the. I feel for the guy because a lot of this stuff is them questioning him years and years later. So maybe by going through the events, you, you kind of remember things a little differently. You, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like obviously you, he would remember that night more than most people, but what were his, what were his statements right afterwards? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, uh, for me, I don't know that I would put him as my number one suspect. I don't have a number one suspect, to be honest with you. He would be somebody, a, a person that I would want to talk to. Yeah, more. of interest. And he might be able to lead you down the right rabbit hole. And I think you have enough evidence that was collected at the scene to either clear him or maybe bring up charges on him. Uh, the thing that I the thing that I can't get over, though, is there was a blood trail that led near the alley or all the way to the alley from the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a couple issues with that blood trail. One could, could Michael Boyd have left that potentially left that blood trail. His car was parked somewhat in that area. It's, it's possible. It's possible. But the way that I've heard this blood trail described, I've never seen pictures of it. So, so I don't want anybody to go crazy on this, Mm -hmm. but the way I've heard it described was that it was a mess of a blood trail, which would, would imply to me that it was created by more than one person. We do have, we do have Shauna or saying she saw two people and we do know that they, they ran off in that area after right. they called for help. I am with you, captain. I do find it very strange that, that, that somebody would attack somebody and then say, call for help. Um, so what I'm getting at is you have two situations to me. I think it boils down to two situations. You either have a situation uh, where wait, hold on. where and these guys stumbled. Go ahead. I was just going to say, unless it's one tacker 
and two guys were walking up and they came up to help. The guy mm-hmm. runs off. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you're going, hey, call for help, call for help. And then you're like, shit, we got to get out of here. Yeah, and you've gotten blood all over your shoes at this point and you've taken off. Right, you might, maybe you have a prior, or, you know, and you were just trying to, look, it's different. If you've been behind bars before, you might go up to help somebody and the cops come and you go, hey, shit, I'm out of here. Um, I'm not messing with those guys again. Well, and if you see the way that they handled the Charles Erickson, Ryan Ferguson situation, that does not inspire you to come forward at any time soon and say, I was there and I stumbled upon this guy. He was attacked. I told them to call for help. And then I left because I was drunk or because I didn't want to be in the area when this thing went down right. or I was afraid. I was afraid that the, whoever did this was still lurking in the, in the parking lot. Right. Um, I, the big problem I have is something that you asked earlier, motive. I, I struggle to find a motive for Michael Boyd to have done this, uh, as well as I struggle to see any motive at all uh, for this to have taken place. It, from everything I read about Kent, he, he seemed to be a, a great guy, well-liked at work, well-liked in, in the community. Um, you know, I know we don't know much about these people when we, when we look into these crimes, we only get to see little snippets and little small sample sizes of their life, but I struggle to find any kind of motive here. This almost seems to me as some kind of random, crazy attack. And I think that that is a big problem that has hindered this investigation that Mm -hmm. there's, there is lack of motive. There is lack of reasoning and why anybody would commit this crime. Yeah. Again, I mean, like being involved in sports, I would, I'd want to know his background if he had any gambling problems there. So, I mean, to me, that would explain how vicious of attack it was. And it would explain why they used his belt. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, even look, I mean, he could have been taken off his belt, but again, I, to me, that's like, it's like making a statement. Yeah. I really just get the feeling here. Like I said, no motive. I feel like he, he came across somebody or some buddies mm-hmm. and there, there was some kind of altercation that broke out into a fight. I think he tried to defend himself in the, in the person or persons, um, you know, for lack of a better word, went, went crazy on him, went homicidal on him. And, mm-hmm. and this ended up being, uh, the result, unfortunately. Well, overall, it's a sad case. You know, it's sad for Ryan and his family. I think it's sad, you know, again for Chucky. And I hope, uh, I hope Ryan does stick by his word and and tries to help him as much as he can, because I think he has the loudest voice and the biggest platform of anybody on this case. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and look, I'm all for good police officers, good detectives, good prosecutors. I, you know, I want to believe in the system. But, the, you know, time and time again, you'll see these cases where the system fails all of us. It doesn't it didn't just fail Ryan. It failed everybody involved and, and then essentially fails us. And you're right. And and while you're pointing out who this was sad for, it was a, it was sad for you, know, everyone, the Columbia community in, involved as well, including the, the Tribune as well. The, the employees there that worked with Kent. But as you were touching upon, Captain it was a sad display for our justice system as well. It, it, it failed us that day. It failed so far as failed Kent, Ryan, and Charles Erickson as well. And I also do want to point out, reiterate that, uh, you know, we have Ryan stating that Charles has his support, that he has Charles's back. He's going to continue to work to get some of these people out of prison that are innocent, including Charles. We also have the Ferguson family. Uh, who has offered a $10,000 reward for any tips that would lead to solving the murder of Kent Heitholt, uh, which I think shows the the compassion and as the well character. as yeah. character of the Ferguson family. Yeah, and if you're interested in, in supporting Ryan at all for you know him being in jail for 10 years, wrongfully convicted, um, check out Ryan Ferguson Fitness, and you can uh, .com. RyanFergusonFitness.com, and you can follow him on all social media. I know he's wrote some books, and I think maybe he has another one coming out uh, this year, maybe. Speaking of books, how about some recommended reading here, Captain? This week we are recommending Queen City Gothic, Cincinnati's Most Infamous Murder Mysteries by J.T. Townsend. I've met Mr. Townsend once, brilliant guy, great writer. Uh, we had a little Zodiac Killer debate. Uh, but anyway, Queen City Gothic is fascinating. It's a fantastic book and JT Townsend takes us on a sinister journey through 13 cases 
which took place in Cincinnati, Ohio, between 1904 and 1971, including the Murder Zone Killer, The Bride in the Casket, and Terror in the Gaslight District. If you like Ohio criminal history or just cold cases in general, then you must have Queen City Gothic in your home library. And you can pick that up and add it to your library by going to truecrimegarage.com and click on the recommended page. We have our Amazon banner on there, which you can use to purchase any of the books or movies that we have listed. And you can buy anything through that banner. Uh, I just bought a base, pretty pretty base. I'm looking at it right now. It's beautiful. I will post. I'm sure there'll be videos online. And it, they just give a little kickback to us, and they don't charge you anything extra. And it's a great way to help support the garage, help support the show, keep, keep the lights on. Mm. If you want to help the show and get something back we we love giving back that's what we're all about here (laughs) so go get the bonus episode the brick of family murders yeah we're very proud of it very proud of it and it's only a dollar 99 you can find that on itunes and you can find that on our store page as well yeah www.truecrimegarage.com also this show was sponsored by talkspace the online therapy company that believes therapy should be affordable confidential and convenient and Talkspace Therapist can put you on a path to a happier life. For a special offer to our listeners, visit Talkspace.com slash garage. Again, that's Talkspace.com slash garage. I love them. I use them. It's very convenient. Check out Talkspace.com slash garage today. Thank you to 